The topic uh, for this session is um, uh, consumer psychology in zero. Psychology, psychology, psychology. And we have Roger Dooley and we have Bart Schutz. Uh, Roger will have a session uh, tomorrow, I think. Tomorrow, tomorrow morning. morning. Yes. And well, actually, so um, no drinking uh, tonight. Be ready for my session. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> that's going to go over well. <laughs> um, and yeah, basically, I didn't prepare any questions for this session because I know Bart. I know Roger. <laughs> I haven't said anything yet. <laughs> no, not yet. So I hope you have uh, a lot of questions about including psychology. Maybe, you're, are there any psychologists in the room except this, this side? <laughs> Two, three, good. Uh, so if you have any questions about how to be a psychologist in zero, or if you have questions on how to get more psychology people into your team, I think those are uh, relevant uh, questions uh, here. Um, so for uh, uh, Roger, uh, for those who haven't uh, seen anything about from, uh, from Roger yet, um, um, author, uh, keynote speaker, podcast host also, so this, this should feel familiar. <laughs> um, and uh, author of uh, books, The Persuasion Slides, Brainfluence, and uh, latest one, uh, Friction, uh, the untapped force that can be your most powerful advantage. <laughs> Very good. And um, so I, I assume you, you brought your uh, friction goggles, right? Yes, I didn't bring the physical ones with me, but I do actually have a demo yeah. pair that sometimes I carry around. But all, my friction goggles are always present in my mind. Good, good. Um, so definitely read the book, then you'll know uh, about, the, about the goggles. And that, that long, strange subtitle took weeks of negotiation between uh, me and McGraw-Hill to arrive at, and finally it was like, whatever, th this is good enough. <laughs> was there an A-B test for the title? No, no, uh, they aren't into uh, testing. <laughs> uh, so uh, some, some uh, improvements to be made. Although, although I did do some uh, actual testing on the cover and the cover design uh, using eye tracking and some other tools, so uh, there was a, a testing component involved. Nice, nice. And uh, we have uh, Bart Schutz. Uh, Chief Psychology Officer at Online Dialogue, keynote sp speaker at every CRO conference around the world, um, and an active uh, consumer psychologist, and um, uh, also active at uh, NIP. Um, what's, the, what's the exact uh, name of the committee again? Uh, it's the Section for Economic and Consumer Psychologists. Yeah. What uh, do you guys do there? And I'm chairing the, the board. The Which is easy because I found that the section was very easy to become chairman. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. That's the trick. That's the trick. Um, so um, first, so we're talking about uh, psychology and, and uh, friction. I think that's uh, an easy way in. So uh, uh, Roger, so the, the friction, is it always bad? Let's start with that one. Uh, actually, friction isn't always bad. It is bad most of the time, and generally it slows down progress in most fields. It makes customer experience worse. It makes employee experience worse, which reduces employee engagement, which there's a huge crisis in today, at least in the United States, with employees not being actively engaged with their company. It determines uh, which regions succeed and fail. Uh, and sort of, uh, but it can be used in a positive way to steer behavior. Uh, if you have two paths, uh, adding friction to an undesirable path, assuming it's in the interest of the consumer or the employee, can be a good thing. Yeah, and uh, Bart, I heard you. Uh, yeah, I do not agree. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's, that's uh, no. why I didn't prepare any questions. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's uh, it totally depends on whether uh, a consumer is better off or is more persuaded with or without friction. We have a lot of examples where adding friction actually uh, uh, helps sales. You know, like undesired pop-ups in front of your screen, which you have to click away, which actually increases conversion rates or. So yeah, it, it, it totally depends. And I think that's the, the nightmare of psychology, that it's human behavior, it's very complex, it's dependent on internal brain processes, on external situational factors. And in that complexity, we are very uh, not good in predicting what's gonna work or not. Um, and that also applies for, for friction. In the Netherlands, we have a saying, zonder frictie geen glans. And I think that like in half of the cases, it's... Without friction, there's no shine. There's no shine without friction. Um, so it can be a very good thing for the consumer, right? Also, I mean, friction for me is also making products incomparable. So people are more following their intuition when they choose. 
and it's a less rational choice, but at least they, they choose more, right? So if you're presenting, for example, hotels, it's, I think it's adding friction that you emphasize different aspects of the different hotels. So one hotel will have a very good restaurant, the other one will have a perfect view, and the last one is very easy to reach. Whereas all three of them have a good restaurant, are easy to reach, and uh, have a perfect view. But by emphasizing these aspects, people are more easily choosing, spend less of their time of their lives you know, considering which hotel, and actually they're more happy with their choice afterwards. So is it a bad thing? I don't think it's a, it totally depends, right? No, it, it does depend. And yeah. uh, I think, for example, the pop-up example is great. I hate to say it, but on my websites, I have a pop-up to subscribe, and uh, it does convert. So, uh, But at the same time, uh, if you're looking for long -term, uh, a long-term customer relationship, uh, you will never go to Amazon and see a pop-up. Uh, they're very focused on a very smooth customer experience. So it just depends on your objective. Yeah, it does. Is, is it uh, also a long-term versus short-term thing? Like the, the pop-up is would, something that would, works right now? <laughs> I maybe would, long term is annoying. I, I think that um, a consumer decision with friction will, uh, on average, lead to more loyalty than a very easy choice. Right? If, if, if you're tonight persuading each other, it's better to play hard to get than to be very easy to get, right? In terms of loyalty in the, in the long run. And maybe it's a strange metaphor, but I think if if consumers are more interacting with your platform because you didn't make it too easy, it might turn out that they see themselves as interactors with the platform on a longer term. So strategically, it might lead to long-term more loyalty if you make it slightly more, more difficult. That'd, that'd be a great test. Yeah. You know, it's, um, uh, and I would predict that in different circumstances that you might get uh, different results. Yes, sure. The, uh, sure. In fact, some brands are famous for adding friction to their process. Yeah. Try and uh, buy a Lamborghini, for example. You, you're not going to necessarily just pop down your dealer and drive away in one. Yeah. Uh, you may have to pre-order it. Uh, yeah. You may have to uh, go to some distant place to pick it up and so on. I and that's part of the experience. Time, exactly, yeah. But utilitarian yeah. products, so like easy daily products, you shouldn't add friction, right? That yeah, should the, be my, very my easy. My Lamborghini was really easy to buy. But after that, <laughs> every one after that's been yeah, difficult. It's so, it's, <laughs> it's so annoying. Um, do we already have questions about how to play hard to get or <laughs> friction or psychology? Who wants to go first? It's the best one. We all remember that first question. Hi, my name is Corinne. Um, cultural differences. I mean, that's US, Europe. Let's put it that way. Is there in psychology creating friction? Does cultural differences make a difference? Yes. <laughs> Next thank question. You, thank you. I, no, I, yeah, I think no, it, uh, I, I didn't get into that a lot, but I think different cultures do certainly have different expectations of how uh, easy a transaction might be uh, in China in the Amos stores, which are not the same I found uh, on this trip as the Dutch Amos stores. Uh, the Chinese Emma stores, everything takes place via their mobile app. You check out with your face, uh, you pay with your face, and it's a totally different experience. And we would find that very strange and difficult, but they find it very easy. Uh, I mean, it's, it's almost frictionless for them. Yeah, but I do like to emphasize the fact that uh, Homo sapiens is, in essence, very similar. Every one of us is a human and our brains don't work very different, no matter what culture you're from or what skin color you have. So the, the baseline is we're similar, and then there are slight differences. Nature, comes nature is similar, nurture is different. Yeah, yeah, well, I, yeah. Not sure about the na whether we're <laughs> in nature different. Because like the biggest difference is between the individualistic countries and we're not that different from the states uh, even here in Europe and the more uh, like the Asian uh, how do you call that the groups group sense uh, community, oriented. community oriented that's that is a big cultural difference and what I tend to do nowadays uh, thanks to the CRO world is if people ask questions like this I look at the bigger data driven platforms like Facebook or Amazon and see whether they are presenting different interfaces to different countries, right? And they hardly ever do. The differences are too small to start segmenting for those groups. But China is exactly the one exception, right? So Booking.com, Facebook, uh, they, they look different. So they're testing, found out 
that they, they, they need different UIs over there. Right? But you know, on the other hand, there are no differences between Booking.com in the US or here in Europe. So the, and, and segment has, has, segmenting has a, a difficult effect for your testing, right? It reduces power, com makes testing more complex. So we are, tend to prevent that. That's why we're in the CRO business. We're not a big fan of personalization. I know you all want to learn about personalization, but you should test whether personalization works in a very proper high-powered A-B test because we haven't seen a lot of uh, powerful personalization uh, solutions yet. Um, so that's when it comes to individual or cultural differences, be very careful because the, the, the differences are, are small, right? The big, goal, the big thing is we're all very similar. Yeah. So as, if I, would, I would emphasize the other thing you should test first are more the situational factors, right? People are, they can decide for one product or another very differently if they're in a different situation. That's, that can be like a counter-effective effect, not a slightly more or less. It's like 180 degrees different. Um, so I would more look into those differences. Next question. His name is Ruben. Yes, and where do you work? <laughs> I work for Online Dialog CRO Manager. Um, the topic of this talk was consumer psychology in CRO. Uh, I was actually just talking to Roger that we as converse specialists or anyone working in this market knows so much more, we get so much more data and we can do, learn so much more and faster on psychology than academics. And it's not just the, the, the academics part. Uh, Bart, you were uh, at a bunch of lawyers, I think two months ago, and you talked about our data, which we have. So consumer psychology in CRO, what, what but the people working in that, what position should we take? How should we help these people ethical wise? Uh, help, where where, help, should, we, where uh, should we grow? Help, help the academics, you mean? Yeah, well, I, uh, I think that's a very valid point because you know when I, you read some of these studies, uh, they get uh, tremendous traction. And you, when we read the details, and it was 50 undergraduate students at uh, a particular university, uh, which it's great, but it may not really represent uh, anything beyond uh, that. And this is why there's been a replication crisis and some uh, actually well-known uh, authors and psychologists have been somewhat disgraced and uh, have left their universities because of that. Uh, the uh, data that they were using was weak. They were using some techniques to find stuff, find significance where there really wasn't. And... Uh, as a result, nobody else could replicate the data, where I think that uh, the data that many CRO agencies collect, if it's done in a very large sample, that is reproducible. Now, things can change over time, or they could change in a different situation, but by and large, uh, you can't really assail the uh, quality of that data. Okay. What was the question? Is the, the question like, how should psychologists within companies take their role, or more the CRO specialists? Yeah, how should the people working in CRO, uh, ethical-wise, uh, see their position within other lines of work? How should we help lawyers? How should, should we help academics? Should we? Oh. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's a, 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 but data over psychology, and it's exactly what uh, Roger is emphasizing. The uh, the whole behavioral science world is based on low-powered samples of uh, usually Western females in the age in between 18 and 22, and the external validity is very very low. And the replication crisis is also because they have a false discovery rate that's not different from ours, right? And, and we nowadays know that at least 50% of our winning tests are false winners, um, which is also always the bad news if we enter a new company that was working with an immature CRO agency. Uh, but if, if I look at the current scientific, the, the, the big scientific uh, institutions, uh, and we go to code conference in Boston, MIT. Half of the talks are by Oxford and Harvard. Half of the talks are by Facebook and Amazon, right? And it's because they have the data. And it's, so in your role as CRO expert, you, you, your fight is against all the opinions and all the, 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 the knowledge that exists in the company, which is bullshit knowledge. And psychologists don't have an answer. They only say it's very complex. You don't know. You should test that. But that's exactly the role you have. So I, I, the cultural shift um, is, is a very big thing. And I think CRO experts are the ones to take up that role. But then we need different skill set, right? We have to be cultural change managers instead of very nerdy data-driven. We think it's very sexy experimentation and data-drivenness, but it's 
not very much, but yeah. yeah so we, we need to develop those uh, persuasive skills, not only on the interface of our uh, website, but especially within the company, be more persuasive. And, you know, you, you learn how influenceable people are. So that same applies for your colleagues. And Bart, be, before we go to Roger, uh, so for those that didn't study psychology, why are all almost all <laughs> psychology studies um, um, have, have participants that are 18 to 24 year old and are female? Because we need uh, 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 respondents, is that what you call it? Participants in the study. So okay. we just, yeah. So we just force psychology students to participate. You're not graduating without participating in at least 40 experiments. So they've been uh, tested over and over again. But and that's where the whole behavioral science is built upon. Yeah. So we, we and also subjects that are that are probably aware of the fact that they're being tested. <laughs> Which makes the external validity completely and nonsense. Yeah, right? and they're, and they're and only they're looking psychology for psychology students yeah. too, so they're yeah. they're not necessarily unaware of the type of tests they might be undergoing. Yeah. I, I very vividly uh, remember uh, doing uh, one study at the at the university, it's a very similar study, and indeed, eighty uh, percent uh, is, is women at the at the psychology study. But the study which was, was one of um, the reasons to study it. Right? Hmm? For me, it was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so my university. I studied, we I studied physics before that. That was a that was a that nightmare. Was less, that was different. <laughs> we no, we didn't have that preponderance of women at my university, but uh, yeah. I would say that in, just to echo what Bart was saying about real world experimentation, uh, platforms like Uber now uh, are also publishing studies, not necessarily on CRO, but I just uh, heard an interesting study about tipping, where they can conduct these massive at scale studies of the effects of tipping, where they've got really great statistics. Where uh, you know, ten years ago an academic environment, uh, it would be you know some tiny sample. And the other area that's also afflicted by small sample sizes, I've been writing about neuromarketing for years, and I, probably some of you are familiar with that. Some of those studies, especially those using fMRI, which is a very uh, powerful but expensive way to measure what brain activity while people are consuming content or viewing things, uh, there the sample size might be as low as 10 or 15 or 20 subjects. And that's, it's interesting, but it's, it's just not really all that uh, convincing. Yeah, and like I said, there can be a big bias in there. And uh, the, the study I, I remember is, is that we did a study on, on uh, you had to rate the taste of a piece of chocolate. Um, and they, they so they just gave you the piece of chocolates and you had to rate them on a scale of one to 10 or something. Um, and they, they, they gave you a piece of paper with the chocolate and the brand name was written on it. So this is a piece of Fercada, this is a piece of Milka. But I, so I got a, this piece of said Fercada. And on the chocolate, it said Milka. So you're pretty, sh you're pretty sure you're in an experiment and I didn't really. <laughs> <laughs> I did, all, I did. the, all those experiments, everyone's always looking, what's the trick, right? Yeah, exactly. Oh, someone is dropping his pen. Oh, uh, probably I'm supposed to pick it up, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that's how mo a lot of those uh, studies go, indeed. Um, any, any audience questions? But right maybe uh, this is also a, a nice extra answer for uh, Ruben. Uh, you have the power to publish in scientific papers. How convincing is that in your company that what you're doing is very, very valid, right? If, if even science is, is asking for, for that information, then the, your board members should listen as well. Right? Yeah. Anyone who wants to walk up? Ruben, Ruben wants to go again. <laughs> no. um, so I have a question for the audience. Uh, you're running way more experiments than any behavioral scientific professor will ever do in his life. You've tested with more participants than he will even encounter in his life. Uh, do you have, uh, uh, do you try to learn from these experiments? Or frame it the other way around, like who does not try to learn from his experiments? Because I don't. Because I don't think we're learning anything. Right. Because okay, I see well, a lot okay. of learnings. So, so Bart, you, you are, are you to asking? You try to. Are, are, I want you, to. You, are you saying that well, we aren't trying to uh, draw more generalized knowledge from the results of the experiment? In other words, we find a result. Okay, this this has this particular effect, so we'll go with uh, uh, option B instead of option A. But uh, we're not drawing any uh, longer term knowledge from that. Yes, I, do, I, I see reports of A/B tests where there's a learning included, and I. I think that the learning never holds. And that's something we learned in, in behavioral science, that when you have a hypothesis, an experiment will never prove the hypothesis. 
if you read a scientific article, there's no, never one experiment. There are always a hell of a lot of experiments because there are alternative explanations possible for the effect that you found, which might not be your hypothesis. So in science, you have to counter all the other possible explanations. And I see no one doing that. And as long as you don't do that, you're not learning. And then who cares, right? Your boss doesn't care. He just wants you to grow the company. So stop learning, stop growing the comp start growing the company, right? Learnings are fake, are bullshit. It's not, we're, it's not true. If you want it to be true, which I would love to because I love the fact that we're finally able to learn from human behavior, but it involves at least 10 experiments for one hypothesis because you have to prove all the, I can go, come up with a lot of, you know, give me a, an AB, winning A-B test and I'll tell you a lot of explanations why that might have happened and you'll have to find out which one is, is the true one, knowing that 50% at least of your winners will be a false positive. Um, it's, it's difficult to learn from human behavior. It's very hard to prove an hypothesis. So either just stop doing it, which I think is a very healthy thing to do, or do it properly, but that involves uh, a, l a lot of effort, right? And that's why we also have a replication crisis in psychology, because we also didn't have the funds to do it properly, powered properly. I, I think you're fighting human nature there, Bart, because people want an explanation. If one thing worked better than another thing, we immediately want to explain we call it the why need that for worked. meaning. <laughs> it's massive in your brain. You always want to know why. By the age of six, you ask the why question 300 times a day. Stop doing that because we just don't know. It's a nightmare to have me as a dad because I always give the answer. I don't know. I didn't test it. <laughs> I'll give that a try. Yeah. Any audience questions? I'm Bauke from uh, Rabobank, whatever. But Rabobank, whatever. Uh, no, it feels like I'm in a crisis now because we have all kind of consumer psychology, which is based on false studies. And we think we have learning from zero, which is also from false tests. So can we better not stop and start drinking? Or? <laughs> <laughs> Well, we yeah, that's what I do. In, uh, I think 15 <laughs> minutes. Yes, 15 minutes. So I think that the positive side, if you're asking for, is there anything positive in, uh, in applying psychology within CRO, is in the ideation phase. Because if you're not into psychology, then you will uh, test to much rational ideas, I'd say, right? It's, it's, it's especially, I love Roger Doody's blog, just to get ideas, right? And that's also why I'm not against neuromarketing. I know the studies are bullshit, but it just gives you another twist in your ideation phase. Um, the problem with neuromarketing is also the statistics behind the uh, and data analysis. Eh? It's, oh, there's a huge bias in there as well. Anyhow, um, so you, you have different ideas, right? And, and the smallest changes can have the biggest effects. We, we all see that on a daily basis. Um, we're unable to predict the outcomes, but this, the better ideas are always based from, from the psychology background. And I'm, we did a meta-analysis within KPN, which is one of our bigger clients. So there were hundreds of experiments and we tracked the source of the hypothesis. So we had three, three types of sources. There was the, like the opinions from the company, right? It's like one third of their ideas is just people that saw something happening at Vodafone Ziga, for example, or, and then they, and they, we just tested that. Um, that, is, that has a winner chance ratio that's lower than a random, right? So we have a threshold and we find less winners than you'd expect randomly. So that's very bad ideas, right? So we, and that's why we tag them because we want our false discovery rate to be as low as possible. And we know that these IDs are bringing the false discovery rate up. So we, uh, that's why we track them. So that's not the way to go, right? That's what a lot of companies do. Then we have the data driven CRO team, but not behavioral expert tests. Good thing is <laughs> the winner ratio is above the random threshold that you would expect. So they're actually bringing value. Um, and I think their false discovery rate is somewhere around 70%. So one third of the test is a, is a true winner. So it's, it's bringing value. But then we have the center of excellence team where behavioral scientists from our company are involved. And they have four times higher uh, real winner ratio. So where the 
data-driven team has an average value per test of 30,000 euros. Our team has uh, over 100,000 euros average. So is there value in psychology in CRO? Yes, there is. But what is it? It's not. Right, it's, it's the ideation phase. They have different IDs that the other, other people wouldn't think of or they would discuss the ID and then with our rational conscious brain, we would counter the ID. That's bad. So okay. Bart, does, does that mean that you, uh, you guys are also testing um, uh, zero teams with and without psychologists and uh, put them against each well, other? Well, it's just that they were scaling up and having multiple teams and that the other teams didn't involve psychologists. So we... It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 and I think it's wrong to conclude from the replication issues that uh, all psychology is bullshit. In fact, there are many principles out there that have been proven many times, both in lab experiments and universities, but also in commercial tests. Uh, you look at uh, uh, Cialdini's principles, for example. Uh, those are commonly used uh, uh, in tests uh, of all kinds uh, and various other things. You just have to be, I think the ones studies you have to be more careful of are the one-off studies where a professor found some really startling thing. And of course, that's what gets the press. So it's, if it's a, a strange finding like, um, if you're on the second floor of the mall, you're more generous in your donations than you're on the first floor. Uh, you know, that's, it's really fascinating and certainly gets press coverage, but uh, you really want to be sure that that's been replicated by other researchers in other locations. And a lot of that, it's called embodied cognition. A lot of that now is looking very shaky. So, uh, but the basic principles are, are certainly valid. Some, there are certain experiments, things like uh, ultimatum game, uh, the, uh, uh, but you are free thing that have been tested in dozens of labs around the world and uh, have pretty good basis for them. Yeah, could also be an SRM on mm -hmm. the second floor. Right. Kind of a sample race, uh, ratio mis mismatch there. Oh, yeah, well, exactly. Yes, like, the uh, samples in the Diego science are too low to, have, to be able to measure sample ratio mismatch. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's another issue, yeah. <laughs> Uh, definitely. I mean, you have to look at like, why were those people on the second floor? Maybe the people on the first floor are in a hurry uh, to get to the second floor and they weren't going to stop and don't. Who knows? You know, there, there, are, there are many other alternate explanations for that, which is why, as Bart says, you know, you really need to test alternatives and uh, make sure you've got robust data. Yeah. yeah and, I th you know, there's, there's a lot of courses out there that you can at least have an introduction into psychology, uh, which I think is al already very good. But it's also very good to hire a... Uh, trained psychologists who studied behavior, human behavior for four years full time. Uh, you're never going to catch up with someone who was so studied so intensely. Um, your, your psychology study was full time? I studied <laughs> psychology <laughs> nine years even. <laughs> <laughs> Twice as good, <laughs> at least. Yeah. yeah. We have time for one final audience question. So this is your chance. Who wants to go? Yes. Yeah, my name is Josh from uh, Zuver, and I would like to know what is, in your opinion, the most underrated psychological principle in CRO? The most underrated psychological principle in CRO, or the most effective then, or that's not being used? Yeah, but it could be very, uh, so the most overrated one is social proof. That's so counter-effective very often. Social proof, always test social proof. I mean, it has an impact, right? It's very, very impactful, but the direction is very questionable, right? We, we did, uh, let's say, uh, if you apply social proof when you're trying to sell loans, right? I've, they've always been counter-effective. We don't want to be reminded of others when we're doing something that those others dislike, right? So it, could, it has a huge impact, but in the wrong direction. So I think that that's, that's that's absolutely I always wrong. give the example that if I'm watching a porn video, I don't want yeah. to know how m which of my friends. So many people are <laughs> watching. This. Bart is also watching this porn video. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at, the, at the same time, yes. Okay, I'll, I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, Did I'll, they test that? That would be. <laughs> I'll, I'll throw one out uh, that is probably less utilized simply because it's less known of Cialdini's principles. Uh, Moses, his six have been out for 35 years or something now. Uh, just a couple of years ago in his book, Persuasion, he introduced Unity uh, that is sort of like a very powerful form of liking. It's shared identity, familial identity, uh, and it's... Uh, goes beyond simply having something in common with somebody else. It's like being part of the same tribe, I guess, to put it in a very simple way. And uh, when you can do that, 
Uh, you, you can be more persuasive, although sometimes the opportunities to show that you're part of the same tribe as somebody else are pretty limited in a, uh, in a large business setting. One business that uh, I think has kind of tried to leverage that is Tito's Vodka from Austin, Texas. Uh, they're uh, now a, a well-known national brand in the U.S. Uh, I don't know how well-known they are over here, but uh, not too long ago they adopted a slogan, Vodka for Dog People. Uh, which is a very uh, unusual thing. Obviously, dogs and vodka have nothing to do with each other. Uh, but they did a couple of things. First of all, they tapped into a very large group of people who were favorable uh, to pets and dogs. Uh, secondly, they didn't say for dog owners or dog lovers. They said dog people. So they're trying to bring in this identity that we, we share this identity. And then actually, the, the, a very tactical thing they did, nothing to do with uh, influence principles, but they also created a hashtag, uh, vodka for dog people, so the people who would not normally share a picture of their vodka bottle on their Instagram feed would, uh, in fact, show their pet wearing a sweater uh, with, the vodka, uh, with the Tito's logo on it. Uh, they would uh, have a Tito's dog food bowl or water bowl. Uh, or in some cases, they would even pose their pet with a bottle of T Tito's vodka and use that hashtag. So not only did they create this uh, uh, liking or maybe even unity effect with the slogan, uh, they turned into a something that could be shared on social media. Thank right. you, Roger. Um, Can I also uh, give one tip? I think a very, very underrated persuasion tactic is uh, variable rewards. Um, so our brain is uh, looking forward to rewards, right? It's not the reward in the moment itself. It's the anticipation of a reward that is driving a lot of our motivation. And if you want it to be very persuasive in the long term, you have to variate the both the intensity of the reward and the timing of the reward. And I see no one experimenting with, you know, very well rewarding your returning customers um, to, in order to create loyalty. So, so yeah, I heard you guys uh, tonight when you order a drink, uh, you'll either get a shot of vodka, you get a beer, you get a wine, it's just... But All yeah, open it's so going to be variable. This could be very <laughs> but, um, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Also, since you're going to feed it to your dog, I just heard. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Actually, I did see uh, one like uh, Starbucks rewards tend yeah. to be very predictable. You accumulate points when you have enough points, then you get a free thing. Uh, but uh, uh, competitor Panera uh, was actually doing that random thing for a while where uh, there may have been some kind of algorithm driving it. But as a consumer, you weren't really aware. Suddenly you saw an email or something on your app pop up. Hey, you get a free cup of coffee or you get a free pastry. Uh, so I assumed uh, that's what they were doing, although whether they were doing it consciously or not, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, but, and a re reward is not only financial, right? It's, uh, it's especially, it's not financial. It's just telling people, hey, you're doing a good job. You're almost there, right? All these green check marks that we, we apply with small sentences, those are always, th those are also rewards for people that they're doing the right thing. So if, if you're going to variate more with it, it's going to be more sticky and more create loyalty creating. Um, so I think that's like a very basic principle from psychology. If you, like, even if you're teaching your kids new behavior, you're going to reward them, right? Do it very well, do it unexpected. They cannot, you should, they should not be able to predict what, whether they're going to get a reward and how high the reward will be. But, yeah, and usually a reward is just a compliment from you. And it's a big compliment, or a small compliment. Uh, so it's a very basic principle in psychology, which I think is very underrated in zero. Um, a great reference uh, is Hooked by Nir Eyal, uh, who shows how uh, these companies that have us all addicted to our devices use variable rewards uh, to good effect. If people, uh, if every time you posted on Instagram you got the same 20 likes, it wouldn't be interesting. But the fact that you get five one time and 200 the next time, that, that makes it exciting to you. Nir, who also spoke at Conversion Hotel. Yeah, indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm applause for Bart Schutz and Roger Dooley. And for yourself. Thank you for Thank all the you. questions. Uh, it was yeah. a final session. Thanks for the uh, Conversion Hotel organization uh, to have us here uh, this year. Make sure to subscribe, zero.cafe slash subscribe, and uh, have uh, and the rest of the evening. you'll get a variable reward. With variable rewards, yes. Bye-bye. <laughs>